That's so cool. How did you hear about it? I was online because um, I was going to look Just Googling donkeys. Like, no, I was like, oh, yeah. 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 Veterinarian is there, and I was gonna see if we could just stop by and, and say hi and let you know what we're picking up. And then I saw the machine. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! So the stars have a line. I know. <laughs> so I was like, oh, your house. Yeah. And so, um, you know, <laughs> see, my talk brings people in. Exactly. Hi, Brian. He got through it, got home, and I don't think he's 100%, but I'd say he's, for the most part, 90, 95%. So he's the over eight? Well, at first, in the spring grass, they think that at first, well, I thought we had an abscess. We had abscess, too. But then all of a sudden, he stopped eating and drinking, and he was flat. And then it's like, okay, I can't, I was trying to get abscess my back was. And I was like, okay, so I can't deal with this. Something's wrong. I need to. I brought him up here and they had him on, night on all kinds of fluids and morphine and ice and all four feet. A little, a little bit of evidence of laminitis, but they said not enough to have that amount of pain that he's having in his hoof. Um, they said it was triglycerides. Is this the same? I mean, are you doing the same how these talk that you gave at? No, no, I haven't given this talk before. I mean, I haven't given this specific talk before. But they you spoke at the flies. symposium, right? Yeah, I, ran I don't remember if I did now or not. <laughs> this year? And then oh, this past year, yes. Yes, yes this past year. Weeks. I thought about medical pathology. Weeks. No, so this is a different one. And this is pretty basic. Clinical pathology, so blood tests. For and he's finally. Um, yeah. yeah, this is. Yeah. 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 It's not going to be anything new for you. No. Uh, we were wondering, but it's not sufficient. We've been through the... Uh, yeah. No, this is basic. We, we, we take a lot of our dogs in the water, but we... Virginia Tech, I'm married to Mount Scott, which is probably going to center us near us. Yeah, but yeah. 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 so a lot of ours go there. It's older injury. Critical. It just, it just, what they do, you know, like hyperlipidemia yeah. yeah. issues, yeah. that kind of stuff. So there, they, we've learned um, a they, lot. They actually and they are really they good. Access. Thank goodness they've got the oh, units there that happen to have a lot of stuff. Recently, that they did a trachea, a trachea on a donkey. I did hear about that. It wasn't one of ours, but I did hear about that. I mean, we took one in last summer with. He was 30 years old. So and he's and flourishing now. He just kept but they're just really good. Better. Great. They're pretty on top of and it. And now he's doing the yeah. zoomies. He's We're starting to zoom. become so pretty on top of it too. And, and, and so they've been able to Every have some well, cases where they're, they're like, you know, perhaps. Like the veterinarians are getting most of it more, right? Because owners are getting more and more educated. I hope so. Veterinarians mostly are feeling like we need to I know, we're finding more and more, like even, um, we have a few different vets we work with depending on the case or what it is. 
even you can't really one grab more pro in their pasture and so they've been so, on it like time her sometimes I'll I'll be like look I don't even uh, wait for I don't even need so to know the results yet I'm going to, to the clinic and you can let them know but how do you how do you think we can avoid it in spring we decided to move here I bought they have me some hay to put on them my mare too
So, um, my name is Lindsay Goodell. I'm the, oh, can you not I hear just me? have a question. Any of the previous seminars available yet? Sarah? Because I knew it, at one point you said it might take 12 weeks to, to get them going. <laughs> yeah, so, the, last, the last one will be up on our YouTube channel. Um, the other ones aren't up on the site yet just because of accessibility and closed captioning issues. Um, but I can send you directly ones that you're interested in. There's a few that we didn't have video for. Okay, so, so I knew at one point there was a yep. poly, poly, political thing. About yeah, not, yeah, it's just an accessibility thing. And so that's why we started using YouTube is that it's a little bit easier to get the closed captioning and have it more accessible for folks. So. Okay, thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your interest. Yes. Um, so my name is Lindsay Goodell. I'm the equine extension specialist for Cornell and I also teach uh, down in animal science. I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker tonight. Um, so Erin is, uh, by training, she's uh, a kind of a diagnostician. She's uh, boarded in preventative medicine. Can you not quite hear me? Uh, so Erin's boarded in preventative medicine, um, but she also is not quite closet anymore, uh, donkey enthusiast. <laughs> and I think it's not an exaggeration now to say that she's world-renowned because she was invited to speak not only nationally, but nationally on donkey issues um, and she uh, I've heard her speak a few times she's not only an excellent speaker but she also just knows so much about donkeys so I'm pretty excited to hear what she has to say they are quite different from horses and that's going to be a big focus for her tonight is just how do we manage them differently than um, regular sized equids <laughs> thank you very much Aaron. all right I was told I have to stand here, so I am not going to move from this spot. Can <laughs> everybody hear me okay? Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Goodale, and thanks for inviting me to speak about donkeys. I always get very excited when I get asked to speak about donkeys because I'm very, very passionate about spreading the word um, about this incredible species. And um, tonight I'm excited to talk to you all about how they are different from horses. So I spend a lot of time talking to vet students and veterinarians and owners about this topic. Um, but this is a new presentation that I made, so it's a slightly different twist on something I spend a long time talking about. Um, and feel free to ask any questions as we go along. Okay, so when I started thinking about this, I started thinking, gosh, I have this conversation a lot with people. And it's very unfortunate, I think, that donkeys look anything like horses, because <laughs> that's why I have to have this conversation over and over and over again. And I guess that's okay. Um, but it's, it's kind of unfortunate in that way. And so I was thinking about other examples and I thought of the wolf and I thought of my beagle and I was like, <laughs> they're very different. And I don't have to constantly tell people that my beagle's not a wolf and my beagle gets managed differently, treated differently, is expected to have different behaviors from a wolf. So that's pretty well accepted. But for some reason, I am constantly needing to remind people that these guys, my donkeys, are not <laughs> my horse, right? They're very different. Very different management needs, um, very different behaviors, very different nutritional needs, um, and that's just the beginning. So uh, we'll get going with um, all the differences that I could fit into one hour. Okay, so <laughs> first off, they are a different species. And I think that's important to know from the get-go. Donkeys are a different species from horses. So the Equidae family includes horses and donkeys, among others, like zebras and such. Um, but when we get down to genus level, Equus, uh, then we break off into Equus sinus for donkeys, the species of donkey, and then Equus cabalis includes horses. So two different species. Um, and just some lingo, if I say burrow, I'm talking about donkeys. I usually call them donkeys. Sometimes I interchange burrows and donkeys. Same thing, just a different name for the same thing. Um, burrow is really the Spanish name for donkey. And I think in the US we use it mostly when we're referring to those donkeys, especially the ones that are running free and wild 
in the Western states, um, but interchangeable, really, in my mind. And throughout the U.S., although there are many, many breeds of donkeys in the world, in the U.S., we tend to classify donkeys mostly based on their size. <clears throat> so here I've shown some pictures of miniature donkeys, standard donkey, and a mammoth donkey. So these are kind of the classifications that it's pretty typical when we're talking about donkeys in the U.S. So miniatures, we're talking 36 inches or less of withers. Standards, we're talking between 36 and 54 inches at the withers, which is quite a big gap there. So quite a, a, a big um, amount of variation in the standards. And so all three of my donkeys that I showed in a previous slide are standards. So there are small standards, medium standards, large standards. And then of course there are mammoths and mammoths are greater than 54 inches at the withers, as you can see here with uh, a former donkey I owned on the far right, it's Toby. He was 16 too. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> that's a big donkey. <laughs> and a whole lot of personality to go along with that. Okay, so along with um, these being a different species, there are genetic differences, obviously, um, including the number of chromosomes. So domestic horses have 64 chromosomes, domestic donkeys have 62, and when we cross the two and create hybrids, mules or hinnies are the hybrids, they have 63 chromosomes. And they're considered sterile, although there are documentations of breedings that have occurred um, where mules and hinnies have, in fact, produced offspring. Um, but yeah, so there are differences in chromosome number with these guys, and that's worth noting. And just to kind of bring everybody up on the lingo of donkey and hybrid talk here, a mule is a cross between a donkey and a horse, as I mentioned, where the stallion, the male, in that breeding is a jack, is a donkey. And the jack is bred to a mare, a horse, and that produces a mule. And then a hinny is just the opposite. So in that breeding, the male is a stallion horse bred to a jenny or female donkey. So we do call female donkeys jennies or jennets, um, and we call intact males jacks. So if I, if I just say those terms without explaining them, um, there you have it. All right, so the first, yeah, go ahead. Um, a henny and a mule, any yes. difference in them other than who their mom is? Uh, like appearance-wise? Yeah, people, I've heard different thoughts. Oh, well, the hennies are such and such. They're more horse-like or, you know. Yeah. Is that just? Behavior-wise? I don't, I don't. No, not behavior-wise. Just, just, just looks. looks. Look. So the question is, are there differences in looks between mules and hennies? I cannot tell them apart. Yeah. I, but, but we keep reading. Oh, I there's swear. A, yeah, there's a, a researcher here that has both, and I have to ask the researcher every time. <laughs> I can't tell the difference. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. All right, so the first topic, because I think it is absolutely the most important topic when I'm talking about how donkeys are different from horses, is behavior. <laughs> so this is, I wanted to make sure I didn't run out of time, so I put it first. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to spend a fair amount of time talking about behavior. Uh, I don't really like this picture, but this picture is really important for a number of reasons. And so we're going to talk about it, and then we're going to come back and talk about it some more. Um, and this is actually a picture I stole from a good friend, Dr. Nora Matthews, who is a veterinarian and anesthesiologist here. And this was taken at another veterinary college, not Cornell, um, but this was taken at a veterinary college. And... First off, anyone in the room own donkeys here? Yeah, okay. Anyone ever who doesn't own donkeys had have experience working with them? Yeah, okay, so quite a few of you. Have any of you ever found yourself in a similar situation, <laughs> right? <laughs> Where you are at one end of a lead and the donkey's at the other end, you are pulling in opposite directions and making no progress and getting really, really frustrated. So I've definitely been there. Um, yeah, so we will talk about this more in a little bit, but definitely a common scenario. Okay, so I stole this. Um, if any of you uh, came to the Donkey Welfare Symposium recently or at any point, you have probably uh, met Ben Hart. Um, any of you had the privilege of hearing Ben Hart speak before? He is a behaviorist, an equine and donkey behaviorist at the UK Donkey Sanctuary. And 
he is phenomenal. He does great work with donkeys and he's a great speaker. And I stole this slide from him. This was the past donkey welfare symposium at UC Davis um, in September. And this is to remind me to tell you guys that perception is everything, right? So when it comes to behavior, um, how we perceive a behavior is, is what we know, right? And there are often more than one, there's often more than one way to perceive human behavior. So when we look at this, right, some people will automatically see happiness is nowhere, others will see happiness is now here, right? There's always more than one way to, to look at a situation and, and different ways to perceive it. So when it comes to donkeys, I think uh, going back to that original picture, um, well, we'll get to that in a minute, but <laughs> perception is really, really, really important when you're thinking about behavior. And to understand a species and to understand their behavior, you really have to step back and ask yourself why, right? Why they act the way they do. With donkeys, it all goes back to their roots and their origins. So there are basically two big major branches of wild donkeys. There, there are the Asiatic wild asses and the African wild asses. And within the African wild asses, there are two different types. There's the Nubian and the Somali wild asses. And at this point, I think through genetic testing that's been done um, in various studies, it's pretty widely accepted that today's modern domestic donkey has evolved from the Somali wild ass, which is shown here in this picture. So the Somali wild ass, um, as you can see in the picture, comes from a very, very arid environment, right? So I've never been to the Horn of Africa, um, but it looks in this picture like it's very dry. It's very sparsely um, vegetated and the vegetation that's there doesn't look really appealing, right? It looks pretty coarse, um, pretty rough stuff. And the terrain looks pretty rough too. So this is really where our donkeys' um, ancestors have, have evolved. And that's going to come into play with just about everything I talk about tonight. So limited food and water uh, basically means that these animals had to, they had to be grazers and browsers. So that's different from a horse. And they had to be able to digest really what we would consider pretty poor nutritional um, forage. And they did this over many hours in a day. So because it's so sparsely vegetated, they basically spend 14 to 18 hours a day and walk about 20 to 30 kilometers in a day. So that's what our modern donkey has evolved from, which is very different, right, from the situations that we find them in today. Um, in most of the U.S. at least. So this picture, <clears throat> this picture is a picture of some donkeys that were recently removed from Death Valley National Park in California. And this was taken just days after they were removed from Death Valley. Again, a place I haven't been to, but as the name implies, a pretty brutal place, right? Very, very hot, very, very dry. And these donkeys, I don't know about you, but they look pretty good, right? Their body condition looks pretty good. Nobody looks emaciated. Um, they actually look pretty ideal body condition. So once again, highlighting the fact that they are very desert adapted and they do really well in that situation. So I mentioned that um, there were the Asiatic wild asses and the African wild asses in my previous slide. The African wild asses have, that our donkeys have evolved from have a type two social um, framework, basically. So they have, rather than the wild horses that live in big bands and form large groups, donkeys in the wild live much differently. The males form territories. So a single male um, defends a territory, a large area of land, and lives pretty much on his own, defending this territory. The females live in really small groups with this year's offspring, maybe last year's offspring. So really small group, two or three at most. Um, so not large groups. And that's because, again, of their desert adaptation. So they came from this really sparsely vegetated area 
really dry environment, they had to, they couldn't live in large groups because there wouldn't be enough to eat and drink, right? So they evolved in this sort of a social framework that is much different from our horses. And I mentioned it here, but I'm gonna talk about it more in a few slides. Because of that, they have developed a more heightened fight response as opposed to a flight response. We'll talk more about that. So horses, on the other hand, uh, evolved um, in the wild in much larger groups. So they form, if they're able to, they form large bands. They have one or two males um, and a whole bunch of females. And for them, living in a big group has lots of advantages. And they were able to do this because they were, they were found in areas where they they lived in areas where there were, were more resources available. Um, and this has many advantages, right? So if you are a horse in a large group of horses, and for instance, you know, you see a mountain lion, you are going to signal to all the other horses that there is a predator there to get the heck out, right? So they have very large responses, very large fear responses, right? So they're classically, they display um, fear with their ears going up, their eyes getting really big and wide, their tail going up, and then they, you know, run, right? They turn and run and that's the end, they're out of there. And that works when you're in a large group. So they have a very heightened, and as we all can attest, at least those who work with horses, a very, very good flight response. Yes? Anybody ever been bucked off a horse and the horse has gone back to the barn and doesn't look back, right? Donkeys, on the other hand, because they evolved in much different social structures where um, the females are living in these really small groups, the males are living by themselves, that type of scenario, that just wouldn't work. When they see a predator, if they just turn and hightail it, well, if you're a male living by yourself, you're probably gonna get picked off, uh, worst case scenario, um, or best case scenario, you're gonna lose your territory, and then you're gonna have to go fight with somebody else to get a new territory. So that's not so good. If you're a female or a foal living in a small group and you turn and run, foal's probably gonna get picked off, right? So. That doesn't work very well. So in these vast arid desert environments, they learned that fighting was better. Um, and they also learned to really hide their fear response. Um, and so that's uh, really important when we talk uh, more about how their stoic nature. But bottom line is that horses and donkeys, two very different scales. When we're looking at fear response and we're looking at behavior, you, it's apples and oranges, right? You can't compare the two. And if you're really used to working with horses, like I was when I first started working with donkeys almost 20 years ago, they proved to be very challenging. If we try to incorporate what we know about horses when we work with donkeys, it can be, can be a challenge. So these guys, donkeys, developed, in contrast to horses, they developed a very heightened fight response, um, which means that we all know with horses, you know, look out for their back feet um, and things like that if they're scared. With donkeys, it's a totally different situation. If they are pushed and pushed and pushed and they're scared, they can usually strike with their front feet or bite. Those are, you know, much more common um, behaviors in a, in a scared donkey that's been pushed, right? Okay, so back to this picture again. Um, so, it's all in how we perceive things, right? This donkey, when you're looking at this donkey, and most of us have had situations where we've been in this type of scenario before as well, how many at the time or looking at this picture thought, wow, this animal is being so stubborn? Anybody, <laughs> anybody willing to admit that? Yeah, so when we're asking, a donkey to move across something it doesn't want to move across. And we don't have a good understanding of what fear looks like in a donkey. So to us, we're asking it to move across this black scale that looks like a bottomless pit, right? And we don't know that this donkey is scared. So asking the donkey to do something, it doesn't look scared and it's not listening to us, we call it stubborn, right? 
So this is <laughs> the Webster um, Dictionary definition for stubborn, unreasonably or perversely unyielding, and they list the synonym of mulish, which is so sad to me, right? It's so unfair. <laughs> yeah, it's so unfair. It's so unfair. <laughs> the injustice. Um, so really, I think, and I would challenge all of you to understand that really this donkey is not being stubborn, but is actually terrifying, right? This is a fear response to the donkey, just putting the brakes on. And sure, we can, and oftentimes, especially the little ones, we can manhandle them and we can get the job done. And in the, at the end of the day, that's, we've done nobody any favors, right? Donkeys learn really quickly. It's another thing uh, about donkeys. And whether we like it or not, they're going to learn um, negative things if, if we do that. that. That won't end well for anybody. If we instead accept the fact that we're asking this donkey to do something that is absolutely terrifying to him, we need to back up, be patient, and re-examine the situation and try to figure out an alternative. So the other thing that I worry about when I see a situation like this is what I just mentioned in the last slide, right? If we push and push and push, and we have a very, very, very scared animal who has a very heightened fight response, and we push and push and push, eventually we could trigger that fight response, right? And that's not good either because you're gonna end up um, bit or, or worse, right? So I would challenge all of you with that knowledge to really try your best to use, to avoid using, you know, words that, I don't know, indicate that the donkey is being, um, is really trying to not, you know, do what we say, right? Try to just perceive things in a different manner. And the more that we we improve upon that, I think the better. So this is just a chart that I took out of the clinical companion of the donkey from the UK Donkey Sanctuary, showing some of the signs of fear that we see in donkeys. And I know it's probably hard for you to see all of them, but I've listed them there too. So they're very, very subtle is the bottom line. Sometimes all you see are clamped nostrils or this tension around the mouth where it looks like you know, like a parrot. They just really like kind of purse their lips. That is a subtle cue, like back off, right? Whatever you're doing is causing excessive, you know, fear in this donkey and you need to re-examine what you're doing. Sometimes you'll see like uneven nostrils or semi-closed eyes, or you'll see, you know, the white part of their eyes, visible sclera, which can also, that can be a normal thing in, in some donkeys depending on their anatomy. But if it's not a normal thing, um, for a particular donkey and you see it, that is a sign of possible fear as well. Okay, so I mentioned this already. Um, these are, as I said, desert adapted animals. Um, they have a very strong sense of self-preservation, right? So they will do whatever they can based on um, where their ancestors have come from and what they've evolved from to not show any sort of pain or fear um, that might be perceived as such by a predator, right? So that is fine, but it makes our job really hard as veterinarians. Um, and it makes our job hard as owners too. So keep in mind that um, in donkeys, frightened can absolutely appear relaxed. Sick can really appear healthy, I've had experience with this, and lame can appear sound. I mean, I've taken radiographs of donkeys that you would not believe, um, and they're completely sound. Um, I also encourage veterinary students and veterinarians to really listen to owners, because um, owners know their donkeys best and have the best sense of what is normal for their donkey. If an owner tells me that their donkey is being dull or quiet, that is probably an emergency. So um, that could mean any host of things, but it, it could be very bad. I've experienced that with my own donkey who actually passed away. It was, I mean, they really hide um, their pain response quite well. So as veterinarians, um, you know, we have to be better about listening to you all and, and really perceiving those subtle, subtle cues. So here are some more signs of pain or sickness in the donkey. Um, and some of them are not necessarily 
unheard of in horses either, but a few of them are a little, a little weird. So in appetence, in donkeys, is an emergency, right? So they have a very um, increased risk of hyperlipidemia, which is basically a metabolic disturbance that can result in organ failure and death. Um, and it's associated with anything that makes them go off feed um, and various other comorbidities or various other illnesses. Um, yeah, so they're at a very heightened risk for that. Dullness, as I mentioned, just being a little off, being quiet, um, can be a real emergency. And then donkeys do this really awesome thing called sham eating, um, where again, they, they want to hide the fact that they're ill or, or in pain from predators. And they have really perfected the art of pretending to eat um, in your presence so that you'll leave them the heck alone. I know you guys are laughing. I, I love the name you gave it. Yeah, well, that's actually, I can't take credit. That's UK Donkey Sanctuary. But I loved it too, so that's great. I use it. I mean, I've seen this. And they will chew, they will swallow, and the food has not been touched. They stick their head in the bowl. They're really good at that. Um, sometimes just a lowered head carriage especially for extended periods of time, sometimes to the point where it can result in a swollen muscle. Um, that's an indication that they're not well. Unresponsive ears. So donkey's ears are awesome, obviously, but they're also always moving, right? They, they are very, they show a lot of um, feeling and emotion in their ears. And when their ears are fixed, no matter what state they happen to be fixed in, that sometimes is an indication that they're not well. And again, I put the lowered ear carriage too there, the helicopter ears, especially when they're fixed, right? If they have those helicopter ears and they're not going anywhere, um, that can sometimes be a, a sign. Social isolation. So despite the fact that I mentioned to you guys that these have evolved as, you know, in small, small groups in the desert, in our hands as domestic donkeys, they really like their buddies and if they are not hanging with their typical buddies, if they've isolated themselves, if other donkeys are out in a group and they are hanging back, that sometimes is a really bad sign too. Oh, uh, increased amounts of laying down, decreased amounts of laying down, both can be uh, issues. Slight weight shifting, sometimes just slight shifting of weight on their limbs can be an indication of pretty severe issues. And then, of course, there are various signs of abnormalities in their mouths, um, and some of which we also see in horses. If they're dropping feed, if they're drooling, um, or just having difficulty chewing. And then they do this thing sometimes when they're in pain where they twitch their tail. And this isn't swishing their tail, because this is their tail goes like that up and down. Um, that can be a sign of pain. I've seen a very laminated donkey that did that. That was it. Wasn't lame, but tail, tail twitching. Um, and then, of course, other signs of ocular eye abnormalities can occur, too. Okay, so another fun fact about donkeys that I think is quite different from most horses I know. <laughs> you guys are laughing again. Um, play fighting is uh, oh so common. And again, I think this all comes back to donkeys and those small groups and the males living by themselves, defending their territory. Even when you castrate males, doesn't matter what age, they never lose this desire to quote unquote, you know, defend their territory. And they will spend hours <laughs> daily doing this. And it can look pretty ugly sometimes, and it can even leave marks sometimes. Um, but they have a blast doing it, and it's actually pretty fun to watch. They fight, they play. I mean, it's it is play fighting, it's really not. If you saw the real deal, you would know the difference, right? But they do spend a lot of time interacting with one another and doing this. Um, another good reason to have more than one is you don't want your donkey to try to involve you in these games. Could you comment on some of the differences? I've seen people ask about, like, they take a video and they're worried that they're actually fighting. Oh, I wish I had a good video. I mean, I've seen... I've seen a video, I couldn't get it offline anymore. It was through this website archive where I got the Somali wild ass picture. Um, but it was a picture of Somali wild asses that were really biting. And I mean, it's very dramatic. The one pinned the other one to the ground, wouldn't let it up and was incessantly biting its neck. I mean, that sort of thing, not like not unrelenting. okay, unrelenting and very, very dramatic. Mm -hmm. But this thing, they 
they mount each other, they spin around in circles while biting one another, um, they bite each other's legs, they bite each other's necks, they chase each other, they vocalize. That's all normal. Yeah. So <laughs> you might get questions about that. Um, okay, pair bonds. So donkeys do have a tendency to form pretty strong bonds. Those are two of mine. Um, and once again, despite their solitary, you know, life in the wild, uh, when given the chance, they really do like hanging out together. And um, this can be quite strong to the point where death or removal of a companion can be very, very traumatic on the other and can throw the other into that spiral of hyperlipidemia that I mentioned, which is so, so difficult to treat. Um, this knowledge also is one reason I really push people if they are sending a donkey into the hospital um, for whatever reason, if that donkey has a buddy, be it another donkey or a horse or whatever that donkey really sees as its buddy should probably accompany it to the hospital. Um, especially most veterinary hospitals are not, shall we say, really built for these types of smaller equids. Um, so if you put a donkey in a horse stall in a hospital and they can't even see over the door, it's like solitary confinement. <laughs> and if they don't have their buddy too, that is that can be the stress that really is the end game for that donkey. So consider that. Um, and then there's always this question I get a lot about, well, can donkeys be companions for horses or mules or ponies? You know, I think donkeys, horses, and mules, there, there is at least one study out there that did show they prefer their own species. Um, but I have seen all sorts of scenarios, right? And I think you can talk to people and anecdotally people do see donkeys bonded to horses and donkeys bonded to mules and, and such, but I do think they prefer their own species. So I always recommend getting more than one, um, absolutely. So, uh, all right. So that was a lot of nutrition or a lot of behavior stuff. And now we're gonna shift gears on another really important topic, um, nutrition. Probably the topic I get um, the most questions about. Uh, so donkey nutrition, much different than um, horse nutrition for sure. They are, again, going back to their desert roots, really, really efficient fiber digesters. And not only are they good at it, they need it, right? They need really poor nutritional fiber available um, as often as possible. I, I told you in that slide, they're used to eating, you know, the majority of the day, and they're used to doing that while walking 20 to 30 kilometers, right? And then we get them, we stick them in a grass field where they don't have to move at all, and they can just keep themselves <laughs> silly all day long on really, really highly nutritional um, forage, and that's not good. I also mentioned they are grazers and browsers. They do like some browse. Um, and like I said, our donkeys don't have the opportunity to walk many miles. So the biggest problem that I see in US donkeys is obesity, uh, the biggest welfare concern, in my opinion. Um, they have a lower maintenance energy requirement than, than a horse of the same size. And they have much lower uh, protein requirements than a horse as well. So they need higher fiber forage, lower protein, less, fewer calories, basically, um, pound for pound. And they still do need vitamins and minerals. So we will talk about that. They are still in need of the same essential vitamins and minerals that we feed our horses. <laughs> okay, so as I mentioned, they need access to high fiber forages. And in an ideal world, and if you look at the resources that are available online, especially through the UK Donkey Sanctuary, you will find that barley straw uh, is one of the most ideal forage types available for donkeys. It is extremely difficult to find here. At least I haven't been able to find any. If any of you grow any barley straw, please let me know if I would buy it. Um, but it is nutritionally supposed to be pretty much perfect for donkeys as a forage source. Second best option, uh, according again to the UK donkey sanctuary folks, is wheat straw. 
Um, wheat straw, however, can be a bit more difficult to chew. It's usually a little more fibrous. Um, so anytime, I mean, not just when you're feeding forage, but you should always have a good uh, idea of the dental, um, the current dental status of your donkey. So they do need to have, you know, the ability to chew highly fibrous forage. Um, low energy, mature grass hay is probably what most folks, at least in this neck of the woods, are feeding their donkeys. And that's probably the best we can do as a fiber source. Um, so the one thing I will say here though, is you cannot, you cannot know just by looking at your hay source that it is a good hay source for donkeys. You really need to test it. This is really, really important. So I am constantly encouraging folks to test their hay before they feed it to donkeys. So if you're growing it yourself, um, uh, we'll talk a little bit more, I think in the next slide about how to test it, but Test your hay. If you're buying it from someone else in a large batch, test the hay before you buy it um, and make sure that it's okay for your donkey. I already mentioned the pros and cons of pasture. Well, I mentioned the cons of pasture. Obviously the pros being pasture does provide exercise, right? Having a large area for the donkey to, to roam about, but the cons far outweigh the pros in my opinion for donkeys. You can do various, um, Adaptations, if you have a pasture available, um, strip grazing is, is one option that might work in some situations. So testing hay, really, really important. Uh, we have a lab here in Ithaca, actually, that is um, world renowned, I would say, for its abilities. And people send samples from all over the place. Um, it's called Equi Analytical. It's not that expensive. It's like between 25 and 30 bucks, I think, right? $22, I think. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, hey, poor hay grower. Yeah, poor hay grower. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So basically, when you're growing, uh, as some of you can attest, when you're growing hay for donkeys, um, all the typical rules that you follow for horses, just throw them out the window and, you know, let it get rained on and, and dry. But uh, cut it really, really late. You know, we want really, really mature um, low, low non-structural carbohydrates, um, and SC. So that's your starch and your sugars. You want those to be really low and you want your structural carbohydrates, your, um, lignin and cellulose to be high. That's the, the really good quality fiber that those donkeys need. So what you get when you send samples into this lab, um, are all of these values and the veterinarian can help you interpret those. Um, and I'd be happy to consult with any veterinarians that, that want help with this. Um, I'm not a nutritionist, but I'm pretty well versed in looking at hay <laughs> options for donkeys. Um, oh, what else? Oh, when it comes to testing, the other thing you have to be careful of is you really want to make sure that you test a representative sample of the hay. So just grabbing a handful from one small square bale is not okay. Um, that's, you know, not going to that's really not gonna be a nice representative sample. Um, ideally, if you're buying a large supply of hay, you probably want to have your veterinarian or an extension person out to help you. Um, there are these things called hay cores that this lovely student in the picture is using in my donkey class. <laughs> so I made them um, get samples of hay bales and you basically can, can get a sample you know, throughout the middle of that bale and testing 12 to 15 bales is probably what you want to do at any given time to know that your batch is appropriate. Okay, so with all that said, you know, high fiber forage, um, limited pasture, don't forget the exercise component, really, really important. So, you know, these donkeys, like I said, they evolve to walk a whole lot um, and you know, that's the Somali wild ass on the right. And this is, I think, what we would all agree is fairly typical, unfortunately, of donkeys um, in the U.S. and the, the U.K. Too much grass availability, not enough exercise, obesity. So other considerations. Um, I mentioned uh, how important high fiber forage is, and that pretty much, it should be low in protein as well, which you would get if you tested uh, at Equi Analytical. So we want um, low protein, 
We want fairly low calories. Your, your fiber, your forage source should cover all the protein and calories that your donkey needs. Um, in general, they need about one and a half to 2% of their body weight in forage every day. That forage, however, is not going to cut it when it comes for, to vitamins and minerals, right? So we need, we need some sort of a ration balancer or some sort of a way to get those um, vitamins and minerals and in our area. Selenium is really, really crucial, right? We're in a very selenium deficient region here in the Northeast. So we often have to provide some sort of a supplement. Most of the supplements that are on the market for horses are not appropriate for donkeys. Not shocking to us, right, at this point. So you have to be careful. A lot of them have very high protein levels. Um, a lot of them have added molasses and things like that that the donkeys don't need. Um, I don't work for any nutrition company, but I'm, California Trace is one that I like, and I, I use it, and it's been great for my donkeys. It doesn't have a lot of extra stuff that they don't need. It's a very small portion that's given once a day. You can, you know, if you don't have very many donkeys, you can feed a handful of it. Um, otherwise, I mix it with some Timothy pellets, just plain old Timothy pellets, no molasses added, not hay stretcher, but Timothy pellets, and add a squirt of a vitamin E um, supplement that I buy as well. That's what that's what my guys get in that green bowl that really is <laughs> asking for. Um, so cereal grains uh, are associated with laminitis, uh, and if you, they're also associated with obesity, and obese donkeys are even more likely to develop hyperlipidemia, as I mentioned before, colic, gastric ulcers, things like that. So we really try to avoid cereal grains, if at all possible. And then, just to make sure that, um, you know, if anybody's heard the rumor that donkeys don't need as much water or whatever, donkeys still need access all the time to fresh, clean water, just like a horse. Um, but uh, their, their, again, their desert adaptation, there have been studies that have shown they can get dehydrated and lose a large portion of their body weight um, in that process without ill effect. They are able to rehydrate quite quickly, which a horse cannot do. Um, they don't tend to get, you know, infection colics right off the bat and things like that. But I'm not advocating for anyone to withhold water from their donkey. They should always have access to clean, fresh water um, at all times. But they're kind of, they're kind of weird in the way that they drink it, right? So they might, they might go long bouts without drinking. It's just a donkey thing. Okay, body condition scoring. So. Again, the UK Donkey Sanctuary has some really nice resources for this. So when it comes to nutrition, this is something that folks should have in mind. They should be um, scoring their donkeys regularly. Uh, UK Donkey Sanctuary has a one to five scale that is um, appropriate for donkeys and takes into account the fat pads that donkeys tend to form. Those things don't tend to go away. So donkeys get fat, they accumulate fat in really weird areas on their body. Um, they also have a different build than a horse, more angular, pendulous abdomen. Um, so actually UK Donkey Sanctuary just developed new weight tapes that are donkey specific too now. I just got my hands on one and some other symposium. So yeah, good resources on their website. And I have some of those listed at the end of this talk. Okay, so moving on to some anatomical differences. So feet are usually the the biggest one I get questions about. This picture, just, just to show you some differences, obviously the small foot on the left in each of these is a donkey, and on the right is a horse. Um, you can see, you can see here, their frog is set a little bit further back, a little more caudal, um, and clearly they have more of a U-shaped hoof than the horse. Um, when you're looking from behind, you can see that their heel is much narrower than the horse. And when you're looking from the side, this pastern axis, as we call it, this angle, is much more upright in the donkey than it is in the horse. But that said, I have seen sometimes folks who trim donkeys to make that really, really upright, like they have to be made upright. They don't have, it's, it's you don't wanna make them more upright, right? So you wanna keep this angle straight. This is supposed to be straight. Um, and so any deviation from that, is abnormal. So if they're trimmed incorrectly and they're walking very upright, that's not appropriate. And obviously if they get the like slipper toes, that's not appropriate either. Um, this is an appropriate angle right there. 
And then just another photo from the front, again, much more narrower uh, and, and U-shaped than the horse. Okay, and then microscopically, their hooves are also, again, going back to desert adaptations, their hooves are better at drawing moisture in from the environment. So in upstate New York, and I know this is probably a little not funky, but <laughs> you get the point, right? This is what it looks like much of the year in my neck of the woods. And if they don't have a dry place to stand a good portion of the day, you will have white Lyme disease and abscesses all the time. And so I really encourage folks to have a nice dry, whether it's a concrete pad, a gravel area, something that they can stand on ideally where you feed them so that they spend a good portion of the day standing there in that dry area um, to, to kind of dry those feet out because they're really good at, at sucking in moisture um, and they're very prone to a lot of those hoof issues. Okay, so here's a cross section to highlight, again, some anatomical differences. So this is a horse, this is a donkey. Um, this top arrow in each of the pictures is pointing to the coronary band, right? So where hoof and hair meet. And then this bottom arrow is pointing to the joint here between the third phalanx and the second. Um, and so you notice in the donkey, it's way down here, way below the coronary band. This is normal, this is a normal donkey. And in the horse, it's almost right at the level of the coronary band. So oftentimes veterinarians, um, you know, if we have a laminitic horse or donkey, um, we're palpating for pulses and things like that. And we might push in at the coronary band and sometimes you can feel a joint there. Um, and if a horse has sunk, if the P3 has sunk, and then you can't feel that joint and you think like, oh, this is bad. Well, in donkeys, when you palpate, oftentimes the joint you're feeling is actually this one, not this one. Um, and this is also important when it comes to interpreting your radiographs um, as a veterinarian. So this is just, I'm giving this information to you um, so that, you know, you can choose to disperse, educate your veterinarians um, <laughs> and whatnot. So teeth, I will, and, Trying to keep my eye on the clock. Uh, I still have so much to talk about. But donkey teeth, I'll just kind of cruise through a few differences. Uh, UK Donkey Sanctuary considers dental disease as the second most common vet problem in their herd of their large herd of donkeys, um, second to feet. And I think the take home, as with many issues in donkeys, is that you don't often see classic signs with oral issues in the donkey. Usually, you know, we think of like weight loss in horses or quitting where they drop feed or, you know, I think I have a slide coming up of a whole bunch of different clinical signs you can see. But the problem in, in donkeys, as I mentioned, they don't always show you anything at all. So I think it's my opinion that a thorough oral exam is really indicated anytime a donkey is not well, right? Anytime you suspect a donkey is sick, it's worthwhile to look in their mouth. Um, and you might be surprised by what you find because they are so stoic. Um, I think, uh, well, I will mention this too. I'm trying to speed up a little bit, but um, aging in donkeys is a bit different. So eruption of permanent incisors is a little bit delayed as compared to horses. I put this in here just for um, reference. Uh, you can get this online. This is available. This is Dr. Matthews. Um, book online, Ibis, but aging is just slightly different donkeys compared to horses. This is that slide I mentioned. This is, these are some of the more common signs we would see um, with oral discomfort, especially in the horse. Uh, we can see these, these signs in donkeys, uh, but just be aware that you may also just see nothing at all, um, and they might just go off feed or just not quite act right. Uh, temperature, pulse, and respiration, normal values for mature horses and mature donkeys, slightly different. Um, again, this is coming from the, for the donkeys, is coming from the UK Donkey Sanctuary. In general, temperature, rectal temperature tends to run a little bit lower. Pulse and respiration tend to run a little bit higher. Uh, so, for veterinarians, and I think as owners who 
need to be equipped to educate their veterinarians if they're not familiar with donkeys. Um, it's really important to really reinforce the fact that cell cues are important. If you're noticing something that's a little off in your donkey, it's probably a big deal. Reference ranges are really tricky when it comes to interpreting blood work and things on donkeys. We don't have a lot of good reference ranges to turn to. Uh, I encourage folks to run routine blood work and things on their donkeys yearly as part of like a health screen if they can, because then at least you can start to see trends. So if values start to change dramatically from one year to the next, that's your reference range, right? Because we don't have a lot of good established reference ranges other, otherwise. These are kind of just random facts here that I've thrown on. Uh, they have a less developed cough reflex. So if I hear that a donkey is coughing, to me that's a big deal because they their cough reflex is much um, more subdued than a horse. They don't tend to cough. Hyperlipidemia, I already mentioned, huge problem. Uh, they have a lot of differences when it comes to drug metabolism. So uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, certain antimicrobials, antibiotics, um, certain anesthetic drugs are metabolized differently. And um, there are publications, more and more publications coming out on that. So I'm always happy to point veterinarians to different you know, publications in the literature. But if you have any questions, um, you know, feel free to have your vet give me a call and I can try to dig up some resources. Uh, potentially, we think, you know, there is an increased risk of hemorrhage during castration. Um, they are a reservoir host for equine lungworm, which means that they have the potential to have lungworm, shed lungworm, not show any signs. And if they're sharing a pasture or sharing an environment with horses, they can potentially give that to horses and horses do often show signs. Um, we can detect uh, lungworm in donkeys in you know, on a fecal exam. And yeah, uh, equine roundworm. Another little bit of a difference in donkeys compared to horses is that this, this parasite doesn't tend to affect adult horses. It's usually just a young horse thing. In donkeys, it, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't, doesn't care what age the donkey is, right? It can affect a donkey at any age, even as adults. All right, a few other things, random factoids. Um, they, of course, are able to bray really loudly, and that's because of this much deeper pharyngeal recess uh, in the back of their throats, which is also a hindrance when, as a veterinarian, you're trying to pass this one. Sometimes you get stuck there. Um, I've talked to vets who have had in the hospital here who have tried and tried and, and been unable to pass the stomach tube, and that's probably why. So just another tidbit for your veterinarian. Um, they don't have chestnut, chestnuts in the rear legs. Um, Male donkeys tend to have teats on their sheep. Uh, venipuncture, so trying to hit their jugular can be more challenging because they do have a thick muscle that runs the whole length of their jugular vein and it tense that up and it tenses the skin and it can really be challenging. Um, so, you know, veterinarians who are not used to hitting donkey veins and struggle a bit more. Um, yeah, flatter withers, that's a an issue when you're trying to ride your donkey. So, okay, I am coming close to the end. I wanna leave some time for questions. Basically everything we've talked about, all the differences that I've covered thus far, I think are pertinent um, in regards to welfare, right? Not only for keeping our donkeys healthy um, and managing them appropriately, but really for their overall welfare. So, when I think about welfare of donkeys, obviously I think the first step is recognizing that they're a unique species and they have very unique needs. We need to meet their basic needs, but what really ultimately makes a donkey happy? Um, I, I guess that's the question and Ben Hart gave a really good talk this past Donkey Welfare Symposium about that um, and really focused a lot on enrichment in the environment. So this is really important with donkeys. It's important with any animal likely, um, but I think you know, if we have good environment enrichment and this source here that I've listed um, is really, really nice. This is the front page of it, again, from the Donkey Sanctuary, but it offers some really great ideas for ways to get your donkey to show more normal behaviors, um, fewer abnormal behaviors, things like, you know, eating your fence or eating your barn. Um, 
those are common issues with donkeys. Again, they have a very high requirement for fiber. So, um, you know, give them something to chew on. Mine get our Christmas tree after we're done with it, and they love that. Um, <laughs> it's their favorite day of the year. Uh, so, yeah, I think enrichment goes a really long way with donkeys. So, in conclusion, so I have a little bit of time for questions. Uh, donkeys are not small horses with big ears. I think I've made that point. Um, it always comes back to the fact that they've evolved from these Somali wild asses who live in a very dry, arid environment. And we need to keep that in mind when we're thinking about behavior, nutrition, every aspect of, of care when it comes to donkeys. And ultimately, when working with donkeys, if you don't already have a lot of patience, you will gain a lot of patience because <laughs> it is required of you. But you should have fun along the way doing it. Um, these are resources that I would consider very trusted, right? There's a lot of information available on the internet. There's a lot of bad information available on the internet. So these are good resources. And again, most of them are from the UK Donkey Sanctuary. If you are trying to pass along resources to your veterinarian, direct them here and here. These top two are available for free download through the UK Donkey Sanctuary. They are amazing books. Um, they have so much information in them. Yeah, they're great. And then this is kind of the owner equivalent. You know, owners can download these as well. Um, all for free, all really wonderful resources. And just a couple more from the UK Donkey Sanctuary. This one here, the health and welfare one, that has so many fact sheets. You could spend like a day looking at um, tons of information about donkeys. And then of course, feeding advice. I turn there a lot. Um, that's a great one as well. And the Donkey Welfare Symposium, if you haven't ever been to one, this is an annual conference. It was held at Cornell in 2016 but otherwise it's been at UC Davis, I think for seven years. Um, it is a great, great conference. If you're ever able to go, it's in the fall. Uh, but if you're not able to go, they have a website where they try to upload all their speaker, you know, all of their lectures. Um, and that, those are available to watch too. So, so much information that is actually reliable and trusted and, and good information out there. You just have to find it. <laughs> so, um, with that, I would like to thank you all for coming and those folks listening in. Um, and I'll take any questions. We have um, two two questions from our online friends. Uh, the first one is: uh, Please explain what do you use the word burro for? Is it just Spanish for donkeys? Yeah. Okay. Just so use it interchangeably, I guess. Sure. So the question is. Burrow, when do I use it? So yeah, I use burrow interchangeably. I like donkey a bit better, but burrow is the Spanish word for donkey. And it, so it's really become, um, I guess, a, quite a common way to, um, especially in Western states. I think most of the donkeys that are running feral, wild in much of Western US are referred to as burrows, but no, it's the same thing. Burrows, donkeys, same thing. Yeah. And question number two is, um, I would love to know what donkeys in the U.S. specifically are employed for. Livestock production or something else? Question mark. Uh, yes. <laughs> so the question is, what are donkeys employed for in the U.S.? Um, uh, mostly they're probably companions, but um, certainly some folks use them or attempt to use them as guardian animals. I didn't, I didn't even go there tonight. Um, <laughs> so, um, I, I, it's a chat has a challenging topic. Uh, I think mostly their recreation in the U S is, is kind of the short answer to that, but people find interesting things to do with their donkeys, pack bro races. Um, that's on my bucket list someday. Uh, you can Google that if you don't know what I'm talking about, but it looks awesome. Um, people drive donkeys, show donkeys, yeah, all sorts of stuff. Did you have a question? I had a comment on the donkey as guard animal. Yeah. 
Some of them are marvelous. Some are. And some pick up the lamb or the kid and by the it. neck and shake it to And death. that is basically the moral of the story, and that's why I didn't go there. <laughs> Donkeys are individuals. Some like that job, some don't like that job. That is not a job I can recommend for any old donkey. And if somebody is going out there to adopt a donkey for that purpose, you better look have out. the ability to return it. Exactly. <laughs> yes, because you might end up with some dead livestock. Um, yeah. And, and some donkeys might do a fabulous job for some number of years and then decide they don't like their job anymore. So you never really know. Yeah. What do you guys do for blood transfusions What for donkeys or blood plasma? What what works? What's the success? That's a really great question. I don't know if I know the answer to that. I think that we have a small donkey research herd here. Um, I mean, can just regular horse blood or plasma be used for a donkey for emergencies or for babies or anything? I think you have to use donkeys. Dr. Smith, do you have any experience giving transfusions? I'm trying to think of the one I had to do. I think and we I have think used our donkey. donkey blood. Yeah, we have used our donkey researcher here in a pinch. I know one instance where they did. I don't know about using horse products. I, I wouldn't comment donkey. at this point that if your veterinarian is castrating the donkey, the rule is ligate or they die. Mm -hmm. That is a, yes, I mentioned You cannot really just use an emasculator like we do on Absolutely. Apples. Yeah, ligate donkeys. Donkeys have a tendency to bleed during castration. They need to be ligated. End of story. Yeah, so thank you. I, I tell people that a lot. Any other questions? Yeah. Are you making any headway on reference values for blood work? Ah, <laughs> ah I actually am. Um, yes, I'm, I'm hoping that our lab, our diagnostic lab, will be able to refer to some reference intervals in the very near future. So, yeah. And we're also now in the middle of a study um, looking at ECTH values, which is um, a way that we diagnose Cushing's in horses and donkeys. And... Currently, uh, Cushing's is a, uh, an endocrine disorder of donkeys and horses, and it can be challenging to diagnose in donkeys because we don't have uh, good values right now to indicate what's normal and what's abnormal. So we have a year-long study going on looking at that in horses, and I've also enrolled a whole bunch of donkeys and even some mules, too. So. Yeah. Um, so because obesity is such a big problem, do you see, like, something similar to... Um, equine metabolic syndrome in donkeys too? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So the question is, do we see equine metabolic syndrome in donkeys? Yeah. Um, they've actually coined the term donkey metabolic syndrome. It's very common. Um, again, a little challenging sometimes to diagnose um, because we don't always have established reference intervals, yeah. but yeah, they, they do, they do have. And do you see like the same problems with like laminitis and stuff as well? Absolutely. Laminitis is a big issue in donkeys. Huge issue. In donkeys. So you mentioned that you don't have ACTH values that you guys like to reference or you, or you just go based on the horse's numbers. Cause we treat a bunch for Cushing's. Yeah. So right now, I mean, we think that they're fairly similar to horses. Um, there is at least one study I know of, but it was almost exclusively mammoth donkeys. I think it had maybe one miniature in the mix and it was at one time point in Texas. So we're trying to look at, because the other thing that affects the ACTH levels is season, time of year and latitude, distance from the equator. So we're trying to look at multiple latitudes across the whole year with donkeys and horses to try. I think you guys just need like a hundred donkeys are here to study. I think we need a hundred donkeys. <laughs> I mean, just think of the studies you could do. <laughs> <Money>. <laughs> I just wanted, the donkeys have a donkey factor on there antigen on the red blood cells, mm, so it's okay. more of an issue going the other direction. Got it. But then mule breedings have it. Yes, neonatal erythrolysis is a big deal. In Any other questions? Yeah. I was intrigued by your mixture with the vitamin E and vitamins. Um, do donkeys absorb vitamin E? Yeah. The, to the topopheryl acetate molecule is pretty big. They appear to because okay. mine, uh, mine went from rock bottom low to really good. Okay. And no, they don't I get any capture. So vitamin E we think of as being, you know, uh, probably uh, found in like 
green grass and um, very green forages. Um, so if I'm encouraging somebody to, to keep their donkey off grass, I try to, to make sure that they're at least supplementing them appropriately. And, and some of the other supplements have vitamin E in them too, and that might be enough. I add an additional one because I found that my levels weren't coming up enough without it. Um, but you can test for it. So that's the nice thing too. It is something that you can test for in a blood sample. And it's one of those things, you know, an annual health check, not a bad thing to look at by many levels. I work in Guatemala and Nicaragua extensively, and there's been a drought there for about six years now. So there is no forage quality. Yeah. And we've been finding the equivalent of mulberry heart and white muscle disease and mm. a lot of etwoods there. And we've been supplementing with injectable vitamin E mainly because we can get it. Yeah. Um, but the if it oral are available and absorbed, that would solve a, a it seems to be. Yeah, issue. it seems to be. We know it is in, in horses too, and I mm. use it all the time orally in mine. And just a, a totally abstentiate, because I can't get there are no laboratories in Nicaragua. Yeah. Um if you test for EI uh, her, uh a cognizance, it must go to yeah. Costa Rica. And just shooting from the hip, I would say donkeys have a much higher level of requirement of vitamin E because we're supplementing horses with almost the same dose. And these are gorilla horses, which are, you know, they're small, they're 300 kilos. And they seem to respond on a lower dose than the donkeys do. And these are, yeah. you know, small donkeys. Yeah, I don't so, know. I mean, it's hard to say without. Yeah, that's that's diagnosis. interesting, but it is absorbed. That's Perfect. good to know. Yeah, I yeah, it, it is absorbed. And the the problem with the injectable too, I think, is that it's going to bring levels up quickly, but then they're going to come down fairly quickly too. So it's it's less sustained um, yeah. than you know a, a daily oral supplement would be. Any other questions? Thank you. Oh, um, oh, no, I, 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 I